everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the UW Center for Cooperatives 2018 webinar series, Cooperative Solutions for Community Needs. I'm Courtney Berner, and I'm the Executive Director at the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives. Today we'll be, we will be exploring how the cooperative model is being used to address care needs, specifically home care and child care. I am delighted to be joined by Margaret Bow with USDA Rural Development and Lori Sathum with the North Dakota Association for Rural Electric Cooperatives. Lori and Margaret will share their experiences in helping to develop cooperatives in the home care and child care industries. Before turning it over to our speakers, I'm going to cover some quick co-op basics. A co-op or a cooperative is a business that is owned and democratically controlled by the people or entities that use its services. A cooperative operates to benefit its members, not to maximize profits for outside investors. People who use the cooperative own their co-op because they finance it in a variety of ways. They share in both the business risks and the business profits. Each cooperative determines what level of financial participation is required in order to establish membership status in the co-op. Members democratically control their cooperatives by exercising their voting rights, the voting rights that come with membership. In Wisconsin, um, most cooperative members are entitled to one vote in their cooperative. Members benefit from the cooperative because they have access to the products and services that they need. In addition, all or part of a cooperative's net operating profits may be distributed proportionately to members based on each member's use or patronage of the co-op. We estimate that there are between 30 and 40,000 cooperative businesses across the United States, with the highest concentrations in the upper Midwest, the Northeast, and on the West Coast. Wisconsin is the state with the second highest number of cooperatives. Uh, Minnesota ranks number one. There are many types of cooperatives found in a wide range of industries, from agriculture and telecommunications to transportation, healthcare, and retail. We often define the different types of co-ops based on who owns the cooperative. For example, consumers, producers, workers, businesses, or some combination of these. Today's webinar will explore how the cooperative model is being applied in two specific industries, home care and child care. While there are many types of cooperatives, they all share something in common. Adherence to the seven cooperative principles. You can learn more about the history and meaning of the cooperative principles by watching our pre-recorded webinar on cooperative basics, which will be available on our website soon. Now I would like to turn the mic over to Lori Sapu, who is going to talk about childcare cooperatives and her experience supporting the development of the Energy Capital Cooperative Childcare. Lori is a development professional who leads rural people through the grassroots development process, empowering them to create the businesses they desire in their communities. She is the Rural Development Director for the North Dakota Association of Rural Electric Cooperatives, where she oversees the Rural Electric and Telecommunications Development Center in Mandan, North Dakota. To complement her development work with NDAREC, Lori provides administrative services to the Rural Development Finance Corporation, the North Dakota Rural Rehabilitation Corporation, and the State Board of Agricultural Research and Education. Lori is a Certified Economic Development Finance Professional by the National Development Council and a 2018 Fellow for the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, or BALI. Now I'd like to turn it over to Lori. Well, thank you, Courtney. I really appreciate this opportunity to visit with everyone about child care cooperatives today. And this is exciting for me because I can finally reference an actual example rather than just simply talking about the model. We flagged this model several, several years ago as one that could help us close some of those gaps in child care capacity in our rural areas in our state. Because we have a high cost of labor and we have labor shortages, and um, that is coupled with high cost of construction, which really makes it difficult to cash flow a child care operation without an incentive. And currently, there are very few programs available, at least in our state, that will help incentivize the cost of operating a child care facility. So my experience has been that cooperatives work best when there's a strong need for a service and other types of businesses are not stepping up to the plate to fill those needs. For example, rural electric cooperatives or telecommunications cooperatives or food cooperatives. And I believe this is true for a few reasons. Uh, first off, developing a cooperative is very time intensive. For people to commit their time and money, 
It needs to bring about something that they can't get elsewhere. And people developing the cooperative typically have other full-time jobs, so this is an additional time commitment for them. And the work isn't done once the cooperative is up and operating. The commitment to operate and patronize the cooperative continues as long as its doors are open. We tried to start a child care cooperative in a couple different communities before one actually emerged. Other ownership models seemed to prevail. Um, for our first two attempts, we worked in the towns of Hedinger and Rollat. And uh, we worked hard there to get something developed. These communities were identified by a regional task force as towns that had a high need for additional child care capacity. And the regional task force brought us in as the technical assistance providers. And that's where we encountered our first obstacle. These communities didn't ask for our help. We were brought in by what was considered an outside entity. So we were considered outsiders ourselves. And you know, because of that, we spent a good deal of time building trust within those communities and needing to prove that there wasn't something in it for us. In Hedinger, we did a child care survey that verified a large need for additional care providers. And then we splashed that all over the local media. We were informing people of the survey results and the emerging cooperative development effort. And in response, a woman from just across the border in South Dakota read the news, bought a house in Hedinger, and opened up a child care center within just a few weeks. So we're like, man, problem solved. Was that, we were surprised, we were pleased, our thoughts, like that was really simple. And maybe people interested in this work aren't aware of the needs. So let's try that media approach again in Rollette. However, different environment, different results. Nobody raced in to start a child care center, and even more difficult, we were pitching an employer-assisted child care cooperative, and there wasn't a solid base of employers that were able to participate in the process. It was a town of 600 people. We did end up with increased child care capacity there, but not a cooperative. The nursing home stepped up to the plate to accommodate an on-site child care center. So even though we didn't end up with a child care cooperative yet, we learned quite a bit. We learned that you cannot force the development of a cooperative. We can provide that information, but people need to reach that decision that this is the model for them on their own. We learned that it isn't a one size fits all, it's malleable. There aren't two communities that are the same and that the needs, the businesses, and the incentives will be different. We learned um, a cooperative is a way to bring more childcare capacity to an area where there isn't an apparent solution to the problem. Um, but people default to the easier method. And in rural areas, there is a lack of access to center or group care. This type of care setting provides a level of dependability to childcare. Since there are multiple care providers, the facility will be open when one of the employees is on vacation or ill. Many rural employers and parents are craving that option in rural areas. So at this point, we had a role in increasing some capacity in two communities, but we still didn't have that cooperative. And another opportunity arose when Basin Electric Power Cooperative reached out about options for increasing childcare capacity in Hayes in North Dakota. We again suggested that employer-assisted cooperative model, and we were finally successful in launching one. So today I'm going to provide some of the basics of child care cooperatives, what they are, how they're structured, and the distinct types. And I'll end by touching on North Dakota's newest child care cooperative, Energy Capital, child, Energy Capital Cooperative Child Care. So in general, cooperative child care adds to existing child care options. The intent isn't to uh, replace the home care providers that you currently have, but to complement them. It's important to make this point up front as communities appreciate the care providers they already have. Cooperative development will typically occur in an area where the local providers have a good size wait list and nobody else is stepping up to the plate to capture that opportunity. Or where there is a need to incentivize the development of a child care facility to keep the costs affordable. The development will start with a local steering committee that guides the development of the cooperative. They have most likely researched all options and have settled on forming a cooperative. 
Generally, the steering committee is comprised of people and entities that have an interest in increasing the care capacity, most likely parents and businesses. In a rural area, it's typical to provide, or it's typical to involve the city or school as well. The steering committee should be complemented with resource providers from the child care field and the development field. For example, the county licensor or someone from Child Care Aware, a local development professional, or, and or a cooperative development professional, just to name a few. These resources typically do not charge for their services and will guide you through the startup phases. I know I've been referring to a cooperative. However, it will most commonly be incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. The bylaws will be written in a manner similar to a cooperative where either the purchasers of the services or the entities that contribute financially are the members who oversee the operation of the nonprofit. This is typically the parents and or employers. This independent corporate structure insulates from liability. We learned that liability is one issue that may stop an employer or a community from establishing an on-site child care facility. So if desired, a cooperative can operate an on-site facility as a separate entity, ensuring for and assuming that liability. Cooperatives also encourage the provision of services at cost. The members, again primarily the parents, are the ones that are setting the fees for service. There will be some funds that go towards the rainy day reserves fund, but primarily the fees will be used for providing the best care possible from the fees paid bringing quality teachers and programs to the center. Through consensus, the cooperative can decide the type of care it would like to provide. For example, are you interested in field trips or music classes or early childhood education? It's member controlled and the policies will follow the member needs. And of course, there's democratic governance. The, mem the members have a say in the policies that govern the cooperative. So let me explain just a little bit what constitutes a member. In a child care cooperative, you are a member by purchasing services from the center. So the parents are the members. In this model, you are bringing the duty of governance to those that need the service and are using the service. You can also be a member by contributing to the cooperative, such as the employer. It works best when there's a con combination of the two. Parents are only members while their children receive care from the center, so there is constant turnover. The employers can bring some stability to the management of the cooperative due to their long-term commitment. Sometimes there is a small registration fee, maybe $25, that serves as a membership fee, and these dollars then would be applied towards the future care of that child. Members will elect a board of directors. The board will set policy and hire the child care director. They will oversee then the child care director as well. The child care director implements the policies, manages operations, and hires and supervises the teachers and aides. In a child care, oh, excuse me, there are several different types of child care cooperatives. There's the child care worker cooperative, the in-home child care provider cooperative, the employer assisted cooperatives, and I'm just going to run through them briefly what each one of them are. In a child care worker cooperative, there is a group of care providers that in a community that will band together to operate their own child care group or center. This is helpful financially because they can pool their money to secure a site and startup equipment. There are some cost efficiencies too. For example, they need to only purchase one liability insurance policy or they can purchase food and supplies in greater volume at a greater discount. By cooperating, they can also gain steady income and employment for workers. They may also be able to secure some employment benefits by working collectively rather than independently. There's a good degree of worker satisfaction because they can participate in decisions that affect their workplace. In a worker model, they have a benefit of sharing in the business profits. Parents benefit from the dependable service in that the care is available even when one provider is ill or on vacation. Another model is the in-home provider cooperative. 
The members of this type of cooperative are independently licensed and operated businesses. By cooperating, these independent care providers can gain access to benefits such as sick leave or vacation. When operating solo, when they are sick or would like to take time off, their customers go without childcare and they need to find alternative um, care or take time off as well. Under this structure, the in-home care providers serve as a backup for each other under a formal structure. There can be time savings as well. Perhaps they will take turns developing meal plans or shopping for supplies or equipment, or collectively work together to share policies, procedures, or forms. They can market together and use their ability to provide consistent service as a bonus. They may decide to create joint special programs together. Perhaps one has an art background and another has a musical talent. And they can purchase together larger volumes for supplies, equipment, or food. And the larger volume may get them a better price. The last one I'll touch on is the employer assisted model. This is the model we use to bring affordability and quality to childcare in Hazen, North Dakota. Hazen was a community where there was a documented shortage of childcare capacity, and in those areas, employers are naturally driven to help solve the issue. They already know that it's difficult to recruit new employees to a community that lack childcare capacity. Hazen is a town of 2,400 people where the women were saying that they were delaying childbearing because they needed to work and that there was a lack of childcare centers available to them. It, means that, it meant that they would have to choose between working and having a family. And seriously, we wonder why there is population decline in rural areas. The research indicates that employers who participate in assuring there is adequate child care available experience a good employer retention rate, so a bonus for them. And there is a reduction in absenteeism because parents are no longer trying to juggle the care of their children when the provider is not available. Employees are also loyal to their employers that care about their families. In Hazen, eight businesses joined forces. It was a mix of energy cooperatives, healthcare providers, a bank, and the school. They formed a steering committee to begin planning for their 501c3. They began their planning by answering questions such as, how many children should we plan for? To answer this, they began with an internal survey of employees by asking simple questions, but requiring no commitment. The businesses verified their internal need for current and future childcare spaces. We had began planning for 30 children, and based on the survey, quickly learned that we needed to think much bigger. When forming a nonprofit, you will want to include additional spaces for the community as a whole. They then considered where they might locate. Here we surveyed available buildings in the community that had potential to serve as a child care center. There were a few kind-hearted contractors that helped us roughly estimate renovation costs and the child care licensor helps us determine what renovations would be needed to bring each building into compliance. We then looked at what it would take to cash flow. This involved surveying area providers to determine an appropriate fee for service. And we learned the ratios for child care, meaning how many children per provider by age. We investigated the average salaries for child care workers, and we used the purchase price or lease price for the top contending building. And we estimated the renovation cost for that building and estimated utilities to help develop our startup, biz, our startup budget and our operating budget. When plugged in, as expected, we were projecting an operating deficit. We then moved forward to determine how to fill the financial gap. Knowing the estimated shortcomings, the employers were able to come to the table with what they would be able to offer. The school offered to provide meals at a discounted rate, plus provide a staff person to come to the center during noon to serve the meals. This helped decrease the number of staff needed and reduce the paperwork needed for the food subsidy program. The bank was able to provide a low interest loan for the purchase of the building and sought a state incentive to bring the interest cost down further. One of the employers had an on-staff attorney that helped complete the 501c3 paperwork. Employers allowed employees to volunteer time during work hours to help clean and renovate the building. 
Some employers also had materials to donate. The involved employers decided to improve the early cash flow of the nonprofit by assuring a certain number of spaces were filled. Each business committed to a certain number of childcare spaces based on their business size or need. If their number wasn't filled during the first three years, they agreed to pay for those spaces during that time period. And of course, cash is king, always. Several of the business in, businesses involved were able to contribute cash towards the startup costs. These businesses were able to take de tax deductions for their contribution to a 501c3. This particular cooperative did not seek government, government grants. However, this is the phase where you would do that. USDA, Child Care Aware, or state or local entities might have some funds available for you. Once we were comfortable we had identified a way to operate long term in the black, we set the board and we began the process of, of incorporating our 501c3. Once the employers knew they would be moving forward with opening the child care center, they began bringing the parents in, forming committees to work on fundraising, developing membership, and launching publicity. Parents assisted in the interview process to select the director, and they helped with the layout of the facility. We then moved on to pre-enrollment, making sure we had a certain number of children registered, and then, alas, the um, opening day, we launched the cooperative. It took nine months to start up Energy Capital Cooperative Child Care. Today they are operating out of a church they have purchased and renovated for their use. Their capacity is 77 children, and they currently have 68 enrolled with 16 employees. They've been open since um, just this May, or last May, excuse me. So through this project, we now have templates for the nonprofit filing, articles of incorporation, bylaws, parents and employer handbooks, and enrollment forms that we can share. And we hope to be working soon on our next one. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Lori. I really, we really appreciate that. Um, so before we move on to Margaret's presentation, I just want to um, remind you that you're welcome to pose questions in the chat box. Um, please just type them in as we're going, and um, we will answer. We will have uh, Lori and Margaret answer your questions after Margaret's presentation. So um, now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Margaret Bow. Margaret has been a Cooperative Development Specialist with USDA Rural Development since 1998. She has assisted in the formation of over 30 cooperatives across her home state of Wisconsin in industries as diverse as long-term care, distributing local foods into regional institutions, arts marketing and galleries, conventional groceries, senior housing, disability services, nonprofit shared services, forest management, logging, and employment among people with mental illness. Margaret now works for the USDA National Office as a resource on cooperative development, but remains based in central Wisconsin. Take it away, Margaret. Oh, actually, hold on a second, Margaret. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, uh, thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Lori, for that excellent presentation. So I'd like to share at another end of the spectrum of aging um, uh, about caring for elders and people with disabilities. So what is happening is that um, our population is aging. Uh, about 20% of the, by the year 2030, about 20% of the population will be age 65 or older. And in many parts, in many counties of Wisconsin, we are currently at that, uh, at that rate. 20% of our population is elderly. Um, in rural Wisconsin, we actually are the future. And it's interesting, in 2014, the AARP did a uh, study, and they asked people where would they like to age. And 87% said that they wished to age at home. But in order to do so, people will probably need a little help uh, to make that uh, wish a reality. About 70% of elders at some point will need help to age gracefully at home, or as some people say, to mellow out gracefully at home. Obviously, the older you get, the more, uh, the higher probability that you will need some type of care. 
also, who can provide that care? If you are fortunate, you may have family or loved ones that can provide it, but that's not always available or even appropriate. Um, so oftentimes people need to turn to higher caregivers to provide that care. And there's two different levels of care. Uh, one is called personal care, and that's any, anything that touches a person, be it bathing, grooming, toileting, uh, transfers from the bed to, to a chair or to, to the toilet, any type of medication reminders. And then the other aspect is home care. Everything from cooking, cleaning, laundry, shopping, taking a person to doctor's visits, anything that keeps their home environment safe and sanitary. sanitary. Um, so it's, it's a way to avoid institutionalization. For some people, for most people, it can be cost effective unless you're getting into a 24-hour care situation. And it also provides dignity and independence for the individual. So you would think that with all that demand, economic theory, I, in grad school, uh, I studied economic theory, and we made hundreds of graphs, just like the one that's on, on, on the screen there. And it would suggest that with rising demand, the cost for services would increase, and that should stimulate a supply of caregivers, uh, higher wages to, to motivate more people to go into caregiving. Um, but that is not the situation in this industry. Uh, what you'll see is that we are facing a crisis right now in the number of caregivers providing care, and the situation is only going to get worse as the baby, boom, uh, baby boomer generation uh, ages. This is the labor force situation right now in Wisconsin. All this data is provided by PHI, uh, data from 2015. PHI, uh, they do research in the home care and the direct care industry. They're based in the South Bronx of New York City. And the median wage for caregiving, home caregiving, in the state of Wisconsin is $10.47 an hour. The median income, annual income, is $12,600, and that's primarily because a lot of this work is part-time. It's very difficult to piece together full-time work. Uh, people tend to want the cares in the early in the morning or early in the or later in the evening, uh, and to try to patch together uh, full-time work. Oftentimes, your client may uh, go into the hospital or pass away. It's difficult to piece that together. And what we are seeing is that there has actually been a 7% decline in real wages this past decade. Uh, there's very few benefits, and as a result of that, 50% or one out of every two caregivers has to rely on some type of support, be it food stamps or Medicaid. And actually one in four in the state of Wisconsin live below the poverty level if they are direct care workers. There's very high injury rates and not surprisingly, 9 out of 10 home care providers in Wisconsin are female. Oops, I think part of the slide is missing here. Um, I'll bring up as much as we can. Um, there are currently nationally about 2.9, almost 3 million caregivers. and. Uh, about 133,000 caregivers have entered into the field. Moving forward with that, oopsie. Um, and what we're finding is that uh, there's about a million more caregivers needed in this field, but because there is such a high turnover rate in caregivers, we actually need 13 million caregivers to provide this care. Imagine, this is very disruptive to the lives of people and elderly and people with disabilities. Uh, caregivers provide the most intimate of care, bathing, toileting. And imagine um, you, you rely upon a caregiver and you're not sure who's going to show up to provide that care, if anyone, with that type of turnover. Every year, 60% of caregivers come and they leave this industry. So it gets back to the question of why are wages so low, given that demand is so high? 
and it comes down to a monopoly situation. Medicaid is the, uh, the major player in this industry. Uh, federal dollars, federal Medicaid dollars are matched at the state level and that provides care. In our state, our state, it used to be county-based, that the dollars, those federal dollars were matched at the state level and it went to all 72 counties. Uh, several years ago, the state of Wisconsin moved to a managed care organization situation. And uh, that has made Medicaid dollars go a little bit further, but that has greatly decreased the reimbursement rates that home care agencies are provided. Medicare is not much of a player in the home care industry. Uh, they were phased out in 1996. Um, Medicare will pay for home care in very limited situations, such as if you are leaving a hospital situation and you can receive care at home for, uh, for 30 or 60 days. Um, home care is considered to be optional by Medicaid. Uh, the nursing home, care, uh, nursing home care is required. Um, so it, it's a very frustrating situation. 87% of people would prefer to live at home. Um, but the primary uh, source of revenue for home care, uh, which is Medicaid, uh, this is not a required uh, 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 way of providing care. And what we are seeing is that, as you can see from that chart, 70% of uh, home care is provided by uh, public pay situations. There is a small percentage that is provided out of pocket or by private insurance. And what you'll see is there are a lot of national franchises going into the home care industry. They only provide service to people that pay out of pocket or have private insurance. But interestingly enough, they pay very low wages. They go with the prevailing low wages that Medicaid has set by their reimbursement rates. So it's a very, very difficult situation. Hence, we have a 60% turnover rate. So why not a different approach? And I have a picture there of the oxygen mask rule. Oftentimes, well, if you've uh, flown on an airplane uh, recently, a uh, flight attendant will remind you to put your oxygen mask on first before you attempt to assist anyone else uh, around you. And that's something that we need to think about with caregivers. They need to be able to put oxygen on themselves first to take care of their own needs before they can provide good quality care to other folks. And that's where the cooperative model comes in. It's an innovative way of, of structuring that type of care. Uh, with a worker co-op owned by the caregivers, they own the agency. They serve on the board. They set the policies for that organization. There's absolutely no franchise fees or profits going to shareholders of owners of uh, those private, uh, private for-profit franchises. Um, and ownership is for the long term. It allows for the possibility for enhanced training and a sense of professionalism, which is very much needed uh, in this industry. And it's an ideal situation for clients because if there's a, a very important statistic there on the screen. Uh, home care worker cooperatives tend to have a 20% annual turnover rate of their caregivers, which is uh, the opposite of the 60% national rate across the country. So it's, it's a possible solution. And I have been honored to work uh, with helping to form uh, the nation's first home care worker co-op in a rural community. And that is in Watoma, Wisconsin, in Washera County, in east central Wisconsin. Uh, it is 39.3 miles away from Stevens Point, where I'm located in the center of the state. Uh, we started organizing that co-op in the fall of 1999, and it became operational on June 1st of 2001. And it actually was a conversion of an existing program in which Washera County was organizing a group of, of uh, private providers uh, to, to provide care for Medicaid-eligible clients. And um, it's, it was an exciting uh, situation. We entered into a major contract with Washera County. 
$850,000 contract providing services. Um, and um, at that time, early in, our, in uh, the formation of cooperative care, um, about 85% of the revenues for the co-op was coming from the county contract and other contracts with other counties for Medicaid eligible clients, 15% being private pay. Um, but the state of Wisconsin has uh, switched from a county-led situation to a managed care organization. Uh, Cooperative Care is working with uh, three managed care organizations plus three different uh, veterans administration um, situations. And um, what has resulted is that the reimbursement rates have stagnated, they have actually fallen, and that has resulted in uh, the cooperative not being able to, to increase its wages. Uh, at one time they were providing health insurance that had to be eliminated. Uh, they start, still are providing mileage reimbursement. Um, the patronage refunds, which in the early years were, were pretty good, uh, that has uh, gone to the wayside. And even cooperative care uh, providing as, as much uh, democratic control and, and wonderful uh, enriching leadership opportunities and professionalism for the caregivers, they have even hit the wall with trying to recruit and retain caregivers. Um, so it's, it's a very frustrating situ situation for them, and they are coming to the reality that, um, that they need to be providing care increasingly for private pay folks. Uh, they can charge more for that care, therefore they can offer higher wages and therefore recruit and retain more caregivers. They would prefer, they really would like to continue providing care for low-income folks that need that care that are on Medicaid, but the reality of the situation is making it difficult. So it was interesting, for, um, for about eight years, there, were, there weren't any other worker co-ops being formed in this field, but then there was a bit of a breakthrough. Um, our uh, counterparts with, uh, in the cooperative development field in, in Washington State, the Northwest Cooperative Development Center helped to organize uh, a few more uh, home care worker co-ops, uh, one in Bellingham, Washington, called the Circle of Life Caregiver Cooperative. And interesting situation in Washington State, uh, they, um, Washington State required that an agency, a new agency, has to be in existence for at least three years in order to qualify to provide services to Medicaid eligible clients. And so the cooperative launched and they started providing services solely to private pay individuals, people that were willing to pay out of pocket for that, for that care. So they were able to charge higher rates, therefore they were able to offer higher wages and much more substantial patronage refunds, and lo and behold, they are not facing uh, caregiver shortages. They are able to recruit and retain caregivers, and it's a very lively situation. So there are now three existing home care worker co-ops in the state of Washington, uh, Peninsula Home Care, uh, and now a new one called Capital Care in Olympia, Washington, and there are four more in process. So it's been a very interesting situation. It's, hmm, we're learning something, and now we're starting to see other home care organizations uh, forming as worker cooperatives across the country using that private pay model, thanks to the, uh, the important uh, groundbreaking work that our friends at the Northwest Co-op Development Center were able to do. So uh, we're fortunate uh, the cooperative development centers uh, organized by the Cooperative Development Foundation of Washington, D.C. We're bringing together the best minds. We're talking about uh, how we can have more of a national strategy to support the formation and the continuation of more worker co-ops in this field. Uh, we've had some excellent uh, assistance from the ICA group out of Cambridge, uh, excuse me, out of Massachusetts to provide some good baseline information. Uh, we've been able to make use of USDA Rural Development Grants uh, to support the co-op development uh, centers in this very important work. Uh, so together, we're, uh, the, we have had two national conferences. Uh, the home care workers are 
starting to network more, to share information, best practices with each other. And uh, we feel that uh, there are more opportunities in this industry if you concentrate on the needs of the caregivers themselves, very much uh, with uh, making sure to place the oxygen mask on the caregivers first so that they are able to take care of their clients. So I share this information with you. Uh, I know across, rural, across Wisconsin, uh, care for our elders and people with disabilities is a real need. Perhaps the worker co-op option might be of interest to you. Uh, if you are uh, interested in this, please feel free to get in contact with us. Uh, Leslie Mead of the Cooperative Development Foundation, her contact information is there. Of course, Kurt, Courtney Berner of the University of Wisconsin Center for Co-ops or myself uh, with USDA. So with that, I think we are ready to pass it along for a question, questions and answers. Hi everyone, thank you so much Margaret, that was great. Uh, like Margaret said, we will now take some questions from the participants, so um, if you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the chat box. Um, and while people are submitting their questions, I just want to share a couple of reminders um, and housekeeping items. So just wanted to let you know that an email with a link to the recording of the webinar will be sent out this afternoon. Um, it will also be available on our website within the week. Uh, the email that goes out will also include a link to a short online evaluation. We appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. Um, it's very short, uh, and your, but your answers will help us continue to deliver relevant programming about cooperatives. Um, a reminder that the Cooperative Solutions for Community Needs webinar series continues with a webinar on June 21st, um, same time, noon to 1 p.m., and the June 21st webinar will be on cooperatives and affordable housing needs. Uh, you will be receiving information about that webinar and how to register soon. Um, if you're interested in learning more about cooperatives in general, um, feel free to go to our website, uwcc.wisc.edu. There are many, many resources available. And if you have any questions or comments specifically about the webinar, um, please contact Lynn Pittman um, at pittman at wisc.edu. That's P-I-T-M-A-N at W-I-S-C dot E-D-U. So, um, it looks like we have uh, a question, and it's directed at Lori. Um, so Lori, if you could unmute yourself. So um, the question is from Jeff, and um, how do the in-home child care providers find each other um, in, uh, in the model that you were talking about? I mean, so the um, child care cooperative that we started up was actually an, an employer-assisted child care cooperative that hired a director. So it wasn't the in-home child care provider. But I would imagine in that case, I mean, we work in small communities. I believe if you would just um, do a little bit of um, media outreach, trying to connect them, if you feel that that would be something beneficial to them or some education in that manner, or maybe even the licensor could help connect them. Mm -hmm. Um, and Jeff, I'll just add, there's a woman named Sarah Pike who works for an organization called Women Venture uh, in Minneapolis or in the Twin Cities, and um, they actually uh, have some money from the Kellogg Foundation to help start um, a cooperative that is um, more of a shared services cooperative for in-home child care providers. Uh, so um, if you want to reach out to me after the webinar, I'm happy to connect you with Sarah, and she can probably share a lot of information about the process they went through to identify um, in-home child care providers. This is Margaret. I would also like to suggest that there is something called the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association, uh, WICA, and they are very much in tune with the child care needs across the state. Uh, they are very much uh, an association that provides good quality information and advocacy, and they recently received a grant to take a look at uh, creating a shared services network uh, amongst in-home providers, which may be a model that works well in, uh, in very rural areas. So I would suggest uh, going to their website, again, that's the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association, and getting in touch with them. They may have some ideas on how to locate in-home child care providers. Great. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so as, as more questions come in, I will pose one. Um, 
So just wondering, a lot of the folks on this, oh, here's another question, I'll, I'll go to that one, um, from Chris. So um, it's another child care co-op question. Um, how has the child care co-op managed health insurance costs, um, presumably for, for workers in the, in the child care cooperative, and um, since that benefit tends to be quite costly? Lori, can you take that one? Sure. So in the model that, or in the cooperative that we just launched, the, um, the health care benefits are only being offered currently to the top two employees due to the cost. So you're right, it's really difficult to, um, to cash flow that. And to cover it, you know, the, the um, fees that are paid for child care services were, were increased to a level that could cover that cost. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. Um, so set, feel free to keep sending your questions in. And in the meantime, I will... Um, ask one of, uh, well, both of you, and I'll have Margaret start. So um, many of the folks on the, the call today or on the webinar today might be you know, approached by people in their community to help start one of these co-ops or might um, take a more proactive approach. And I guess I would like to hear from both of you sort of um, as you know, an extension agent out in the community, um, an individual member of the community, or, or an economic development professional, um, sort of what should be their first steps in thinking through whether or not this might be a model that could work in, in their community. Margaret, do you want to take that first? Right. Uh, yeah, this is a, it's a very good question, Courtney. And I always stress that the very first thing up to think about is that is the concept a viable I business idea? because cooperatives are businesses, they need to cash flow, they need to, to cover their costs, and is working together the best way to make it happen. In other words, you just can't go it alone, that you need other people, and that uh, coming together to form a business together makes sense. And then you would start, uh, start by uh, exploring the idea, the business idea, a little bit more. Certainly reach out to the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives, or if, in, you're, if you are in North Dakota, to the North Dakota uh, Electric Co-op Association, and uh, start researching getting more information uh, so that you can make informed decisions. Uh, learn as much you can, as you can about the industry and learn about as much as you can about cooperatives. Thanks, Margaret. Lori, do you have um, your perspective you'd like to share? Well, I agree with everything that Margaret said. And um, when we first meet with a, a group of people, absolutely want to, you know, verify that they're willing to work together on this because it's a long-term effort. Um, and we usually start with, on a child care cooperative, anyhow, just verifying that basic need, going out and doing those child care surveys to see, you know, are people, do people have the type of care that they're looking for? Are they lacking care? Are they looking at having children in the future? Making sure that you're developing a business that's actually needed by that community. There we go. And, and actually bring in as many resource providers as you can to help you along the way. Those um, child care aware people, the um, licensors, the co-op developers, local developers, it's um, good to have everybody on board. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. So I have a, a follow-up question for Lori. Um, so you mentioned that there are a few different ways to organize child care cooperatives. There's a worker-owned model, parent-owned, um, sort of employer-owned, um, and some combination maybe of, of those. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk us through um, some of the pros and cons of using the various models to start a child care cooperative or things that you came across um, and sort of what led you down the path of choosing the model that was chosen in your community? So I think it really depends on who steps up to the plate to address that child care capacity. You know, and the in-home care providers, they still want to provide that care in their homes. They're happy doing that in their homes, but they're looking for further connections either for efficiencies or, you know, to cover when they're not able to care for children due to vacation or sick leave. Um, and so for the worker co-op, they, they are um, not interested anymore in doing it in their homes. They most likely have been doing in-home care provider, in-home care, and um, either the demands are growing beyond what they want to provide or can provide in their home 
or they're just looking for an alternative space. And then those workers come together and form that, that worker cooperative. And so in our case, we didn't have any providers involved. We had um, parents and we had employers that were just desperate for additional capacity. And in those cases, the employer-assisted child care cooperative seems to, it, it did work best because the employers have that financial um, resource where they can invest some money into it and it makes sense for them to do that. And they also have some ways to provide that in-kind contribution. I'm not as familiar with the um, parent co-op. I know that those have been formed in California and the ones, the ones that I'm familiar with have been parents within a particular business. So it's a, a larger business and the parents are looking to um, to develop additional child care capacity and it, it will typically be an on-site child care center where the parents operate that nonprofit. Okay, thanks Lori. So Margaret, I'm wondering um, if I can direct the next question at you. So there, when we think about developing new co-ops, there are sort of two main approaches. There's the grassroots approach where um, a group comes to us and um, says, you know, we want to start a cooperative, can you please help us through that process? And then there's what we sometimes call the incubated process or a build and recruit where um, a nonprofit or, a, um, you know, an employer, a, a set of businesses, um, a government agency might um, sort of start the co-op and then recruit the workers to be members and um, ultimately own that cooperative. Can you talk a little bit about those two models in the context of home care? Um, and any mm -hmm. thoughts you have on, on how to apply those models in that context. Right. Um, oftentimes when we think about uh, something unique, uh, such as a marketing co-op or, or some type of shared services co-op, it, it makes sense for it to be very much from the ground up that, that people realize that they've got a, a shared need and they want to come together and they want to form. Uh, however, over the last 20 years of, of helping to form home care worker co-ops, uh, both Wisconsin and nationally, what we're finding is that uh, care providers, caregivers, are some of the busiest people around. And, you know, frankly, they don't have the time to invest in, in the two to three years it may take to actually organize a cooperative. Um, so what we're finding for, for home care worker co-ops, it might make more sense to, to have a more incubated approach. Some people call it build and recruit uh, because, you know, frankly, caregivers, um, they deserve the benefits and the professionalism and hopefully the higher wages and ownership that uh, a worker co-op can provide, but they may not have the resources or the time to devote to the, to the, to the entire process. Uh, so we, we may need a, um, a sponsoring organization to, to help organize that co-op and then uh, train and pass it on to the, to the eventual owners themselves. Great. Thank you, Margaret. All right. Well, we're closing in on the hour, so I want to um, thank our speakers, Lori and Margaret, again and um, send you, just remind you again that a link with a recording of the webinar will be shared shortly and it will also be on our website within the week. Um, please uh, take a moment to fill out the evaluation and send us your feedback and I hope that you will join us on June 21st for our um, webinar on cooperative housing. Thanks so much everyone. Have a great day.